This week, we jump in the cockpit of one of Tom Cruise's greatest films as we honor the 30th anniversary of a fist-pumping classic. Do we have what it takes to be the best of the best? It's time to find out, because we feel the need, the need, to remake Top Gun right. Hello, my fellow cinematic architects, and welcome to Remake This Movie Right. We are a member of the Hollywood Outsider Network. Listen to episodes of Remake This Movie Right on iTunes. Reviews are appreciated. Your podcast app of choice, or just visit the website at RemakeThisMovieRight.com. Remake This Movie Right is a show that takes an original film that has an actual remake in the works, generally, figures out what still clicks and what doesn't, throws a little bit of humor at it, and then we determine exactly how Hollywood should remake it. So by the end of each episode, we will have the remake ready to roll for Hollywood execs, and presented to you in movie trailer form, provided by the vocal stylings of Wayne Henderson. We are here to tell Hollywood how to remake this movie right. My call sign is Maverick, but you can call me Aaron Peterson, and I'll be your instructor for this uh, little training exercise. Shut up, Brian. You wait. Your turn. All right. Hey, as long as I'm Goose. <laughs> nope. That's fine. You're not. Joining me for training today, his call sign is Iceman, because he loves oily men on men volleyball. You might remember him from our last Starfighter, Never Ending Story, and Jumanji episodes, Scott Clark. I am honored I got Iceman. That's actually kind of cool. You thought you were going to be Goose, didn't you? I kind of did, yeah. 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 We're going Those against, well, the, against the, type. The list, of be- the list of better flat tops is very, very short. <laughs> that was one of the most epic flat tops in history. It's kind of phenomenal. That's what it was. Well, plus, I'm really good at chewing gum and going... Well, plus I don't. How want are you? With, how are you with strutting with your chest out, wearing only a towel? Oh, <laughs> pretty good. Pretty good. Whoa, that's just all right. That's all that's required. Brian, it's not. Your, it's not your flying. It's your attitude. <laughs> You're dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Uh, well, speaking of, well, he goes by Viper because he's as cranky as a snake and has twice the bite. You might remember him from our Ferris <laughs> Bueller's Day Off, Ghostbusters, and Pet Cemetery episodes, Mr. Brian Williams. Oh gosh, I so wanted to be Goose, but after that intro, how could I? You know, how can I argue with that? So <laughs> nobody wants to be Goose. Goose dies. Spoiler alert. <laughs> I, look, I'll tell you a little bit. I'll tell you a story later. You may understand. How's that? Okay, but he still dies. So I'm just letting you know. Uh, I hope it's a happy story. Is it sad? It's a, ha- it's a no, no, it's a very happy story. It's okay. A very happy story. Well, we're doing a pair of special episodes honoring two anniversaries of some of the best summer films that could maybe use a fresh coat of paint. For this one, we are celebrating the 30th anniversary of the film that made dungarees seem cool, Top Gun. And if you've ever been in the Navy like I have, you know exactly what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> the worst place front pockets in history. God, who thought bell bottom? I mean, yeah, you'll float. Sure, but no chicks are going to talk to you. God, it's awful. <laughs> Certainly not Kelly McGillis. All right, well, no, they're officers. They don't have to wear dungarees. All right, well, May 16th, 1986, $356 million worldwide is what this puppy came out. So it is 30. Do you guys feel old? A little bit, yeah. I remember seeing it in a the theater as a so teenager. A fresh wow, teenager, is... a brand new teenager, but still a teenager. I was six. And where's the ejection? He is goose. Where's the... And, <laughs> yeah. Where's can't, the... can't reach Scott the handle. immediately gets the goose death right now. <laughs> Bam. Boom. You're, you're shot anyway. out at 400 miles an hour, banging your head on a piece of plexiglass. Mm. Hmm. Well, Top Gun tells a story, if you haven't seen it, if you're one of the four that haven't seen it. Top Gun tells the story of a hotshot pilot named Maverick and his co-pilot Goose who are sent to the Top Gun Naval Flying School where they'll learn and compete to be the best. Along the way, Maverick gets involved with his civilian instructor and things get heavy as the film zips along. Let me just say, uh, yeah, that would be frowned upon in, in normal normal military dealings, but what are you going to do? I think it was frowned upon in the movie, wasn't it? Oh, it would be frowned upon a lot more than than what it was. Navy, <laughs> Navy don't play. None of the military play. How was the Coast Guard, Brian? That was kind of that's kind of the military. No, it's very much the military. <laughs> first of all, <laughs> and, <laughs> okay, yep, <laughs> you're an asshole. I'm sorry. It's fired for up. the re- yep. Brian's oh fired up. my god! First of all. It is equally frowned upon because we use the very same UCMJ, which is the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Uh huh. So, uh, yeah, it is definitely frowned upon in a uh, very, very strict manner. 
All right. Maybe not quite as much as some of the other branches, be honest with you. Well, so. if they're in the military, it's even worse, but you can't, you really, <laughs> you're not supposed to dangle your berries with anybody. Is really what the rules are. Well, this is true. That's really, true. but she was a <laughs> civilian contractor. That's true. Yeah. She kind of works by her own rules. She does. They don't. <laughs> Military doesn't play like as loose as they are in this movie about, ah, well, he's, he's such a hot shot. He's going to learn. They don't, they don't do that. <laughs> I think one time is really all you get to, to flip off uh, a MIG. Or do a flyby by a, you know, a tower yeah. that you shouldn't be when you've been told, no, we're, we're full. <laughs> exactly. Uh, the movie was directed by the late Tony Scott. He's no longer with us. And it starred Tom Cruise. Kelly McGillis and Anthony Edwards as Goose. This is one of this is like one of those '80s movies where you watch it and you're like, "This reminds me of the '80s." Like a whole decade is reflected in this one movie. You got Harold Faltermeyer score. You've got um, the direction by Tony Scott. Everything's fast and quick. You've got oiled up volleyball. You've got, you've got like the the dark vignette that drapes over the top third of your screen at any given time. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> The whole thing, man. Shoulder, you've got shoulder pads. Do you know that John Carpen Carpenter turned this down? Thank God. Would this be John Carpenter's <laughs> Top Gun? <laughs> It'd be like a horror movie. Well, wait. That could that means Kurt Russell might have been in it. So it uh, could have been fantastic. They missed out. <laughs> okay. Well, a little bit of trivia. We always talk a little bit of trivia before we get into what we love about the movie. Even though I think you've already heard some. Uh, Val Kilmer did not want to be this, according to IMDb. So. It's fairly, it's better than Wikipedia. Is what I'm saying. Vale Kilmer did not want to be in this film, but was forced to by contractual obligations. And also, director Tony Scott was officially fired three times during production. <laughs> what? Yeah, I, and that I, should be on your business card. <laughs> and if I remember right, I don't remember where this is a long time ago. If you were alive, I guess. Yeah. So if I'm if I'm correct, and I believe I am, Val Kilmer and Tom Cruise at some point got into a fist fight during production. Yeah, they didn't get along at all. Like uh -uh. they. That, that chemist, that anti chemistry that you see on the screen is like real. <laughs> the real acting came at the very end when, with the whole "you can be my wingman anytime." Well, that they, was yeah. that was like Oscar. There, there was yeah. eight seconds of actual acting between the two of them. Other than that, that was all legit. Mm -hmm. um, what else we got? The real Top Gun school gives a five dollar fine to anybody in the staff that quotes the movie. <laughs> <So you're> not, <laughs> you're not allowed. Right in the back of the, this film's success, and I remember this, the U.S. Navy actually set up recruiting booths in major cinemas to try and catch some of the adrenaline-charged guys leaving the screenings. They had the highest application rate for years as a result. I believe it, 100%. Mm -hmm. Actually, yeah, I, I read a very similar stat that they received in the year or so following the release. They actually received the largest number of recruits since World War II. Wow, since World War II? Yeah. Since World War II. <laughs> They're That's like, I want that guy's job. Uh, we got a couple more. This one is my personal favorite. Tom Cruise actually had to wear lifts in his scenes with Kevin McGillis. Yeah, he did. Cruise, Cruise is 5'7", <laughs> McGillis is 5'10". He's like, I'm such a man. Let me get up to you. <laughs> Wasn't there one where she had to stand in like a lower area too, like at the dance scene at there the was, very end? Yeah, there were, the scene where they she in rabbit ears right now, the, the quotations, places the, the money in the jukebox. Apparently, she's standing in a ditch that was dug to make them on the same level. I don't know why they decided a ditch would be better than putting him up on a some sort of a step. Maybe a it's an e it was an ego thing. He probably felt bad after all those lifts that he had already been dealing with. He's like, man, can't we just hire smaller actresses? <laughs> <laughs> Shorter ones. <laughs> All but right. you know what? Her actual date, like the the scene that we see her in in the in the bar, the nightclub, mm -hmm. the date that she actually has in that is Pete Pettigrew, who is the who was at the time the original, like he was like the real Viper from the real Top Gun school, and also one of the primary consultants for the for the movie. So, well, he shouldn't be dating old, civilian yeah. contractors either. You know, just it's frowned well, upon. I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> You know, do what I do, not what I say. Or I, do what I say, not what I do, whatever the case is. <laughs> Reverse that. I read something kind of cool. You know the scene in the uh, in the elevator where Kelly McGillis' character is wearing like a baseball cap? Yeah, yep. And uh, they're having this conversation and the officer walks in and they have to pretend like they're not talking <laughs> and all that. That, sh that scene was shot like after all the other production was done. 
And you can tell because Tom Cruise's hair is like a lot longer in the front. Mm -hmm. And that's why she had to wear the hat because her hair was already colored for another movie that she was filming, that she was in the middle of filming. So they had to hide it somehow and they put a, they put a cap on her head. Well, it was adorable. So yeah, we won. Kind of worked. Mm hmm. Uh, speaking of Kelly McGillis, the character is actually based on Christine Fox, who's a civilian flight instructor who probably did not have sex with Tom Cruise. The producers met on a visit probably. to Mir probably. <laughs> who hasn't at, <laughs> but, but who hasn't at this point? <laughs> to Miramar while doing research to prepare for the movie. Fox eventually rose to the ranks at the Pentagon, retiring in May 2014 as acting assistant secretary of defense, the highest post ever held by a woman at the Department of Defense. Huh. That's really That's cool. Really that is interesting. And very last, I thought this was a kind of a, a cute uh, nod. After the car chase, when Charlie tells Maverick that she didn't want anyone to find out she was falling for him in that ridiculous scene, Maverick <laughs> originally had a line to say, Tom Cruise forgot the line and ad-libbed by kissing Kelly McGillis. Some states call that assault. Tony Scott liked it so much, he left the scene just like that. Do you know what the line was supposed to be? Uh-uh. Do you? No, I don't. I don't. Totally curious. God, why did you set that up, Scott? God. I, <laughs> I just thought it was sweet that he, that's where the kiss came from. It came from Tom Cruise forgot his line. And it's one of them. It's a memorable kiss. Mm -hmm. All right. Can I get like military nerdy on you guys for a, one second? Uh, you I can, got, as long as it doesn't I bring got, me back to, to boot camp because it's not a good memory. It doesn't. Okay. If you notice, Tom Cruise has got a CB's patch on his jacket, mm -hmm. which is like an, like an infamous jacket for movie you know, history and stuff. The reason why the patch, the CB's patch is on the jacket is because they actually built, well, one of uh, some of the sets that was involved with the movie. The CB's is actually a construction unit and it has nothing to do really with flying or whatever, but because it's aesthetically pleasing to the eyes and stuff, they got it on there. So congrats to the uh, CB's who get recognition for something they, they did. So, what, what, why do we care about the CBs? I'm just it's kidding. It's the little guys, you jackass. <laughs> I'm just kidding with you, you <sighs> cute little Coast Guard people. All right. Well, before we get into what we love, it is time for I a... I swear to God, I'm going to punch you in the afterburner. Uh, if you're in the military, you understand what the fights are. All right. Go Marines. I love it when you give us a ride. All right. Here's a clip from Top Gun. You think your name is going to be on that plaque? Yes, sir. That's pretty arrogant, considering the company you're in. Yes, sir. I like that in the pilot. Remember, when it's over out there, we're all on the same team. Tell them in this school is about combat. There are no points for second place. Dismissed. It's going. The uh, plaque for the alternates is down in the ladies' room. Kill me. You really don't. <laughs> I don't care what anybody says. Val Kilmer is great in that movie. <laughs> oh, yeah. So is Anthony Edwards. Oh, my God. Yeah, it, it really is one of the best Anthony Edwards roles of all time. Well, not Revenge of the Nerds. Very... Yeah, he's got like nope, three. Not, not Revenge of the Nerds. It, it's ER. Well, it's, it's Goose, and then there's ER, and then there's really pretty much nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to our... And this is a guy... Oh, and this talking. is coming from a guy who got referred to as Dr. Green in through a weird circle of friends. Just saying. You did? Yes. You look nothing like him. No, I'm way shorter, but I have the very same hairdo that he does. You're bald. Yeah. In ER. Was he bald? Not the same hairdo in Top Gun. Just saying. Oh, was he bald I've, in I've ER? Got, yeah, I've got the, yeah, yeah. In ER, he's got like oh. the Captain Picard thing going, you know. I was the, too busy the, living yeah, my stuff. life. I don't remember. All right. <laughs> Well, the original movie, what makes this so memorable? Scott, why is this movie so memorable to you? Is there moments, memories, scenes, what? Well, the first one is is a memory. I, this is actually a film I saw in the theater, like I mentioned earlier, and I didn't see a whole lot of movies in the theater, as you guys are well aware. And like I said earlier, I was six years old, and I remember specifically because my parents made me go see this movie. I had no interest when I was six years old. I don't know why. It seems like it would be a great movie for a six-year-old to want to see. Mm -hmm. Um but I I wanted so badly to go see Flight of the Navigator, which was like my favorite movie as a kid, which is weird because I had to look it up. I'm like, there's no way that came out in the same year. And it's actually like eight years earlier. 
So it must have been like a re-release in the theater or like a special theater showing or something. And I was so mad I wanted to see that and I had to go see Top Gun instead. So I kind of went into it begrudgingly. Mm -hmm. Like I don't want to I don't want to see this movie and it wound up being awesome. So but the big thing for me on this movie is I've never been a big fan of war films. And I understand that this is more about training the pilots than it is the actual war that's going on. Mm -hmm. But uh, man, it just made war seem so freaking cool. (laughs) It just. (laughs) I just, it just really did. Well, yeah. Blowing <laughs> shit up is the freaking bee's balls. I'm just saying. It's like, bam. But I mean, right, but at the same time, you don't see anything blown up until that final act when they're actually engaging the enemy. Yeah, that's Everything true. is like, all right, I got you. You're in my sights, and you're dead, but we're not going to actually blow each other up because we're just playing the game. And somehow they made that awesome. I agree. Mm-hmm. Anything else? Good memories? What, what do you well, love about it, this movie? To me, it was just the iconic shots of the Tomcats taken off of the aircraft carrier. You know how they like they just shoot forward. You got those twin engines in the back burning, and then as it finally lifts off of the off of the aircraft carrier, the the back end of the plane just kind of comes down a little bit because of the weight, and then it, it kind of like looked... dips down and then like just shoots off the freaking yeah. You just want to just go raw. I need meat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's almost like if you see that in any other movie now or even like a commercial or, or anything, you automatically hear Kenny Loggins in your head. There's just oh, there's yeah. just something about that song that that works so well in that intro. It's just a bunch of takeoffs and landings and dudes with those those flashlight batons and it just it just feels so awesome. So so it, good. I was telling Scott, they play that theme song more than I think I've heard any theme song played in any movie ever. It, it's yep. it's like at least three or four times I heard Danger Zone. It's more than like the actual theme of the movie Danger is played. Zone. Yeah, right. <laughs> I don't, Brian. It does not sound like that. You, you, you're sounding like an Aretha Franklin version of Danger Zone. <laughs> Brian, what makes the movie so memorable for you? First of all, it's one of the first movies that I can remember watching that made me want to have a career. Hmm. It's one of those like, oh my god, I I want to do that. And I guess had I been old enough at the time, I probably would have been one of those gajillion of people that signed up to join the Navy right after that movie aired. So, but for me, it was one of those movies that I, that I really liked and I really loved, but there was a situation and this is a story that I referred to earlier. I was in a training class that was put on by the Navy. I sat next to, to my best, one of my best friends and shipmates that I was stationed with. So we're, we show up to this course we're, we're, we're sitting here and, and I'm just sitting there and I, and I'm literally just twirling my pen through my fingers a la Iceman. And, and I lean over to, to Tim, Tim Baldwin, my buddy. And I say, Tim, this just looks almost just like that scene from Top Gun. You know, you know we got this guy talking to us. He's telling us, it's, it's like firefighting type stuff, whatever. Next thing you know, Tim starts quoting me lines from the movie. I get chuckled. And it's kind of like you, when you get chuckled like in church or work or someplace that you know laughing is the last thing that you should be doing. Oh, yeah, yeah. And you can't stop. And the more you try to stop, the more you laugh and you can't control it. Tim's quoting lines from the movie to me. I'm quoting lines to Tim. It's, it's just back and forth, you know, yeehaw, Jester's dead, you know, that kind of stuff. Or I'm in tears, Tim's in tears. And finally the guy's like, all right, we're going to take a break. And as we're all kind of piling out for like a 10 minute break, he, you know, he's like, Hey, whatever you got to do, get your shit together. You know, don't be like you've been for the last freaking 20 minutes. You know you need to you need to act straight and you can't and you all you're doing is making it worse and you're just crying and from laughing so hard. For me, that's that's kind of what cemented it as one of my favorite movies, pretty much of all time. Whoa, so, all time, huh? This is on your like top ten all time list. Tentatively, without actually making a list, yeah, I'll, I'll say yes. Uh, I remember seeing it at the theater, like most people. I had seen Tom Cruise in something on HBO, and I couldn't remember what the, for the life of me it was. And at the time when I realized you know, a lot of people are against Tom Cruise now, man, I thought he was the coolest guy on the planet, on the planet. I'm like, he's flying planes. He's doing all this cool stuff. He's getting the hot instructor. You know, everybody's looking up to him. Riding a motorcycle. He's riding a motorcycle faster than he ever should. It's very dangerous. He's just the coolest guy on the planet. He's got that cool aviator jacket. I mean, just everything about him is cool. He's just cool. He's just a very cool guy. And then you, you start living this glamorous 
world in your mind. And um, my both my grandfathers were in the Navy, so I'm like, wow, this was really cool. My grandpa's like, it is not like that at all. And so <laughs> when I eventually did join the Navy, I learned how accurate he was and how wrong this damn movie was because it's not that cool. It's just not. I mean, it's a lot of hard work and it's a lot of doing what you're told and get in line and you're owned by the United States military now. Uh, mm-hmm. About the only thing that was really accurate for the movie is you're writing checks your body can't cash because they did quote that a couple times, but that's really about it. But I love the movie, man. I, the Need for Speed, I think is great. Buzzing the Tower. I remember like once I got a car, I started buzzing the cops and stuff like that. You know, you just, you, you think of little things like that because you think, ah, I'm as cool as Maverick when really you're just the guy that's going to be paying a ticket. And uh, <laughs> even beach volleyball seemed cool. Even the beach volleyball scene, which I know everybody's like, it's so it's homoerotic now. It's so weird that it just pops out of nowhere that these guys want to grease up and play beach volleyball. I'm telling you, what, that happens. Which which is such a freaking BS kind of uh, take on that because a couple of these guys, are they're actually like wearing blue jeans and playing volleyball. Mm-hmm. Thank yeah, okay, you. Well, I was watching that this week too. That's the most uncomfortable thing to play sand volleyball in. Yeah, and I I have played volleyball. I have played tournament volleyball. I have you know played league volleyball, and I'm more I guess critiquing the okay. You just hit the net. What the what kind of crap yeah, is right? that? What you know <laughs> that's okay. That's a side out. Whatever. What kind of rules are these? What kind of yeah? <laughs> to me, there's no homoeroticism with any of that. I attribute that to Quentin Tarantino in a scene from a movie back in like 93 or 94, something like that. I don't know where he had a small role and it was such a great monologue that he did that it it really kind of stuck this perception into a lot of people to where they, now it's kind of become ingrained in pop culture. That's a homoeroticism take on a one man struggle with his, uh, with his sexual identity or something. But, Wow, well, that went to a different place. But anyway, <laughs> I really like the beach volleyball scene because when you are in the military, that does happen where you have you have to find things to buy with your with your friends, play basketball, whatever whatever the sport is that you have available. I assume San Diego is going to have a volleyball court. Totally makes sense. So it was it was just it's just one of those things. I just love everything about the movie. Probably the only thing that I would disagree with with liking would be the chemistry which I guess will lead us right into what doesn't work. I, I don't necessarily like the chemistry between McGillis and Tom Cruise. I actually agree with you 100%. That was the first thing on my list that didn't work for me. Uh, less the chemistry. I just didn't like her very much. I, I don't I, – because she was kind of an unknown at this point, wasn't she? hmm And – Well, she had done Witness. Of, she had done Witness. Witness was yeah. before that? Okay. Yep. She just didn't do a whole lot for me. I mean, she's she's kind of – I wouldn't want the movie without her at this point, just because I'm so used to it, and and she's almost as iconic, you know, she's on the cover and all that. But I don't, I don't know. There's just something about her that just didn't work for me. Like, you, was she too confident, or or did she just feel like she was reading some of those lines? I don't know. It just something was not right, and I kind of want, I kind of wish that had been a little bit different. Well, I think my biggest problem with her as a character was that you know it was the it was the '80s, and they were trying to create a different perception of a female character, make her very strong, very independent, which is what a person in her position would be like. And instead they, they did make her kind of the generic fall in for the guy rather easily. I mean, if she was trying to fight her attraction to him, I sure don't know when it was because it sure didn't never seem like it. So it was a little bit too, I don't know, too, too weak to a degree. It just, it just, the chemistry just never worked for me. Some of the stuff that I read was basically, she was originally scripted as a, slut so to speak she was just what a, yeah well that's and, not cool and basically one of the executives in charge of signing off on the movie was like i'm not signing off on this unless you make her a smarter more realistic person and then that's what spurned the charlie that we see today wow deep dark secrets from the mind of brian williams right there boy Oof. not from so the mind just from the I'm just sorry. from the internet sorry not the I'm, mind the internet <laughs> 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 I don't think I read. Uh, do you guys it's, think this movie is cheesy at all? I don't, but I know some people that do. No, no, it's simple. No, it's no, still, I, it still works. This for me, this movie is still kicks ass as much as it ever did, and it is still just it's just pure adrenaline, and it's it's all fun. I'm not gonna say it's not cheesy. There's some lines that are just that just you you couldn't put in a movie today and and it be taken seriously. But I wouldn't want the, I wouldn't want them not in this movie. 
it's just it's just part of the experience it's part of the awesome fist pumping stuff is these is these goofy i don't even want to call them cheesy i just they're, they're, they're just sil- fun silly things that that just they just work for me i, I cheesy sound has such a negative connotation to it and mm-hmm. i don't want them not in this movie do you scott being the only one here who didn't didn't serve his country valiantly just, just kidding. I didn't serve it very valiantly. Did did you um yeah. did you Since watch- the guy that got like got out in week three of his no, boot camp. I, I went longer than that. I got an honorable. Right. I'm a Five veteran. Weeks. I'm a veteran bitch. <laughs> Suck it. Scott, by chance after the movie, did you think I wanna join the military? Ever? Nope. <laughs> not even first not even for a second? No, I just wanted to fly a plane. I figured yeah. I could do that without joining the military. Yeah, well, you'd be shocked how many people join the Navy thinking it was that easy. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just join, man. I'm really good at Space Invaders. I'll be really good at, a, at the cockpit of a plane. Yeah. yeah. Guess what? <laughs> Eight out of a thousand end up in that cockpit. So simmer down there, buddy. <laughs> All right, so should this movie even be remade? It's the question we always ask of any movie. Should it even be remade? We are going to do it regardless, but should it be? I don't think this specific movie should be made, but... Can we build off of it? Absolutely. Man, this is the hardest one I've, I think I've come come across yet doing this show with you. Mm-hmm. Because I don't, I don't think the movie is perfect at all. But like I mentioned a second, the imperfections are kind of part of the appeal of the movie. The, the, the little goofy things or the... I, I've just seen it so many times, I don't want it to be any different. I, I love how the story plays out. I, I don't want anything to change and I don't want to see someone fail to capture what might have been a product of its time that a modern revamp wouldn't be able to capture. Does that make sense? No, it makes total sense. Yeah. This is about as close to no touch status for me as any other movie we've talked about because I don't want anything different. I don't want more to the story. I don't want a backstory. Exactly. Exactly. I don't, I, I just want it exactly the way as it is. It's not like an older movie that doesn't hold up. This movie is still just, a ton of fun to watch and I've seen it <laughs> so many times and every time I, I just can't keep my eyes off the screen. It's so much fun to watch and I know exactly it's, what's going to happen in every scene. And when Meg Ryan cries, this is maybe the best. I don't care about her orgasm scene in when Harry met <laughs> Sally, but this moves me more than any Meg Ryan role in history. Mm-hmm. Is when wow. she's when she is upset about Goose dying, it almost still brings me to tears. Yep, especially because you kind of are expecting her to hug Maverick, mm-hmm. and instead, when it looks like she's leaning in for a hug, she just kind of takes her hand and puts it at the side of his face. There's something oh. about that decision that was so touching, because you were totally expecting a hug. Wow, oh, that's really good. Yeah, there's like this. There's still this bear. I know we're close. I know you're you're practically family, but you're not family. But there's still this barrier that's right here, and I'm so distraught, and I don't know how else to express it. But I can't go. Plus, there. It's almost like not not so much I can't go there, but just I can't cross that barrier. So type of thing. Plus, she's she's so upset herself, but she also mm-hmm. cares so much about Maverick and hates to see him upset at the same time. Mm-hmm. I, I feel like I don't see that in movies very much. Like we're both sharing in this grief. I'm not just worried about you. You're not just worried about me. We are both distraught with the situation. Equally distraught. Yeah. Oh, you guys okay? I yes. feel like you need a hug. Can we pause? Maybe like the wipe a tear or something. I'm just. <laughs> no. Yeah. No. I'll put I my need, hand not, on your I face. Just, <laughs> oh, but don't touch it. Don't touch it. Just get close. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I, I say no. I think it's a product of its time. It's still very cool. It still plays. Leave it alone. It's not one that needs a yes, remake. Yes, we agree. 100%. Yeah. Woo. With that, let's do a little bit of a clip from the original Top Gun before we get in here and remake it anyway. Here you go. <laughs> you were in a 4G inverted dive with the MiG-28? Yes, ma'am. At what range? No, about two meters. Well, it's actually about one and a half, I think. One and a half. I've got a great Polaroid of it. And he's he's right there. Must be one of the nice pictures. Wasn't uh, Thanks. Lieutenant. Like the what were you doing there? <clears throat> Communicating. Communicating. Keeping up foreign relations. That was, you know, giving him the bird. You know the finger. Yes, I know the finger, Goose. I'm I'm sorry. I hate it when it does that. I'm sorry. I just you were in a 4G negative role 
Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I'm talking like through that whole quote, just so you know. I, I Luckily, I had it muted. Hey, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. All right, well, here's what we know about the intended remake. There's not a whole lot. We do know that Tom Cruise has actually met with Jerry Bruckheimer about doing a sequel, a sequel to Top Gun. So I don't know. I assume he would be an instructor because, trust me, the Navy's not going to keep him flying planes at that age. I don't care how cool Tom Cruise is. So I don't that- care how fast you can run at the camera. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> This is gonna run in a wheelchair. The best gonna... hand movements in running movie history. Just saying. <laughs> yeah, and so... I'm doing them right now. Just you can't see it, but I'm doing it. <laughs> Makes for great radio, man. It does. <laughs> so they're, they're talking about it. We we possibly could get a remake, but since it is definitely eventually, maybe possibly going to get a remake, and because we are basically covering two historical summer movies as they hit their anniversary peak. And because nobody really listens to us anyway, how should they remake it? Now, to clarify, if you're never listening to a podcast, when we do our remake, we are working to get to one cohesive film. So not three separate films, one cohesive film. All remake selections that are debated about are settled by a best of three vote. And each one of us gets a single cut, which means if they don't like a direction we're headed with any story element or a cast or casting element, whatever, they yell cut and they can change it to whatever they prefer. They can only use it once, so use it sparingly. I, I should note... That in 1996, the transfer of uh, Naval Air Station Miramar to the Marine Corps was coupled with the incorporation of Top Gun into the Naval Strike and Air Warfare Center at the um, the Fallon Air Force Base in Nevada, Reno, Nevada. So doesn't but, really roll off the tongue quite as well. Sure, does it doesn't. It's been it's been a long time since so I had to roll that crap out too. My E two three four D days. <laughs> So wh- who's got the best idea? Who wants to start? What do you, how do we do Top Gun for 2016? Like I mentioned earlier, this is a movie that I don't want remade. So this became the most difficult thing to come up with ideas because every idea that I come up with just sounds like the stupidest idea ever because the the, the story in this is so good. Everything leading up to it, the the training segments and the the camaraderie between the guys and uh, him falling in love with the instructor and Goose Goose's death, and then the final act. It's just it 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 has this epic feel to it for just what is basically a training movie, and uh, so. But I thought about it and I came up with a couple ideas. The first one is, well, it's not even really an idea, but it, it's so hard to modernize this movie because we live in a world where the technology is so much further advanced than it was when this movie was made. Mm-hmm. Dogfighting just doesn't happen anymore. You know, any if there's ba- if there's air battles that they're going to be shot from way further away than close combat range. It's it's so you it's really difficult to make a movie where you're going to have planes that are that close to each other that don't have these long range missiles that are shooting from 80 miles away or something like that. So they're so in order to make a remake, something's got to be done to make it necessary for close combat dogfighting again. Mm -hmm. And what I came up with is kind of like a Red Dawn situation. So in our story, they're on in this, they they train on this aircraft carrier, just like the, just like the original movie. But instead of it being in the Indian ocean, it's actually on the East coast of, um, of the United States near Boston. And after they finish the training and the award ceremonies and stuff, they get attacked by whatever enemy it is. Cause they didn't really say who the enemy was in the movies. Did they? It was Russians. No, no, they left it. They left it unknown. Yep. Right. I mean, they were MIGs, which is yeah, with you know, they which were, is from yeah, Russians. yeah, the MIG, yeah, right. The MIG twenty eight was actually made up, just so you know. But yeah, it's. I don't think they ever really designated a actual villain. No, they didn't. They right. left it unnamed. So whatever, whatever enemy is attacks their aircraft carrier. They're, they have no aircraft carrier. They have no planes, but they're just off the coast of Boston. So they, whoever's surviving, which is including our hero, which we don't know if it's Maverick and Nice Man and all that, but they escape to uh, Westover Air Force Base, find some aircraft, you know, that's assigned to them by by the military that's still there. They basically have to scramble, and instead of fighting over the ocean, they're actually fighting over American soil, like Red Dawn style. And so I'm picturing dogfights that aren't in the wide open spaces like they were in uh, in the training in Top Gun or even over the ocean. You know, I want to see some dog fighting where they have to maneuver through some buildings and Ooh. recognizable U.S. Ooh. over Landmarks. either. Yeah, thank you. That's what I was looking for. So basically, so. you're everything else in your remake is pretty much close to the original. It's just that last act. 
right? That is the so last far, thing that you're talking about. Because I don't, I don't really know what else you do with with training to make it well, I mean, more not, interesting than it already was. Yeah. Hey, not I every mean, what, remake what, that's, it needs to be a drastic overhaul. Sometimes it's just little nuances. So that that's good. Right. Top Gun, which is okay. It's the title of this elite military pilot aviator school. You're kind of limited on what you can do. That's that's new, man. That that's that's not bad, brother. Most of my additions or tweaks or, or whatnot, I didn't have like a whole big story arc that I wanted to change either. I actually really liked that, Scott, just because I did feel like it was a little basic. I mean, it was kind of like the exact same dogfighting as I, mean, I still loved it. Don't get me wrong. I'd slow down, people that are sending hate mail. Oh, that's the best dogfight in history. I get it. But it is very much just like the first part of the movie. I would rather have mm-hmm. like you have that basic open the soft opening so to speak with like it was in the in the original Top Gun, but then you have that inner city dog fighting. I think that could be a really cool final act, and would even be a little bit more exciting. Not that the other the first movie wasn't exciting, but it would be like exciting for a new generation because you mm-hmm. almost have to have it. That's a really good good idea. The stuff that I would I would keep that. I love that idea, so I'm going to second it. So boom, there you go. Two two out of three, and I think Brian really liked it too. What I would like to do is instead of, because the the daddy issue, I actually think it could be done well. I think it wasn't done. Well, maybe it was done well for 1986, but every Tom Cruise movie has had that. So we've got enough of, of the dead daddy thing. What I would like to do is I want his dad to have flunked out of Top Gun. Not that he was a, not that he was a bad military man or anything like that, just that he couldn't make it in Top Gun. It was extremely important to him. So Maverick is trying to, he has that drive. He has that need to succeed because he wants to redeem the family name and he wants to make his dad proud and he wants to do what his dad tried so hard to do and and couldn't achieve. I think that's a good driving factor without it being more dead people in the, in the rear view. You know, I mean, that's, that's just the way I like it. That whole storyline in the original was just, I, I didn't really care. I feel like it was touched on two or three times, so I'm with you that I don't really think it it needs to yeah. play. I mean, th- that was such a minor thing to me that could just be thrown out just as easily as as redone with the whole like, chip on his shoulder kind of thing. I, I, although I do yeah, like it, the idea it, that it, he has something. Yeah, it's to almost. Prove. It's, I mean, it really, it's almost like you you forget about it, then you're going. Somebody goes, "Well, you remember your dad was such a you know he had such a bad reputation." And you're okay, all right, whatever. And then, but you know, hey, Goose is dead. <laughs> you know, I care more. I'm I'm crying over Goose. I don't give two shits about Maverick's dad. Right, because that was a long grieving process in the movie for Goose, deservedly <laughs> so. But I felt like it was 20 minutes of of dealing with with Goose. Well, I mean, it was like his best friend, and he did. Oh yeah. Die. I would I would hope that would shake him up some. Mm-hmm. Uh, the only other thing that I really had was I I liked the fl- flirtation of Maverick and Charlie. I liked it when they were flirting. But I just don't want it acted on, at least until he completes his training and saves the world at the end or something. Because I just, I just, I would rather have the will they, won't they than, oh, look, they're doing it. And there's, there's take my breath away again. You know, I just, I just don't want them to consummate it until it's all done. The only things that I would change the minor things that you talked about are kind of things that I, that were in my list of things that don't work. And I, and I kind of didn't get a chance to talk about those, but like the sex scene. To me, is one of the most awkward sex scenes I've ever seen in a movie. Which is funny because it's it was for the longest time considered one of the best sex scenes ever. Really? Yeah, it was. There's yeah. So much tongue action and silhouette form. Maybe you're doing like, it wrong. Just... Did you ever think about that? <laughs> uh uh-uh. uh. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe you got too many lights on, Scott. Just saying. Yeah, maybe you need a big maybe white sheet. Try to sell a wet action; it might work a little bit better. Oh, that's Ugh. funny, Brian. What about you? What story elements did you have? To me, there is only one Maverick, and there will always only be one Maverick. And I'm sorry, Tom Cruise is Maverick. I would say you start out maybe. So is Mel Gibson, technically. Huh? I see what you did. So it was actually, James no, James Garner. Garner. James Garner. So you're wrong, Dave. Yep. Anyway, mm. so to continue. I would say you start up with you have a 15 to 20, 30 minute deal with with the, our hero kind of finishing up the school. He maybe he goes to the ship because the instructors at this at this stage right now, currently Top Gun is not as we touched on. It's not in San Diego. It's in Nevada. And the school is actually geared towards teaching the in, instructors who go back to their units and and 
teach the pilots there. He's the, uh, you know, he's the instructor. He's finishing up the school. He goes back to his ship or base, whichever. He's got to teach and coach maybe the, the nearest, you know, or the newest rendition of quote unquote Maverick and eventually fly with him to maybe beat back some Lithuanian air force. I think we do the same thing and don't give them a nationality. Just, you don't need to, and I, again, they're in a Lithuania, plane. They don't order dinner or anything. You don't need to hear an accent. Right, right. You put, you put some little icon on their helmet and, and smoke out their, their visors and it doesn't matter where they're from. That does so, lead, yeah, into, I, lead in well from the first movie too, because like the final shot or one of the final shots is where he's talking to, uh, uh, Strickland from Back to the Future at the very end of the movie, and he's and he's talking about how he's going to be a flight instructor, and he goes Top Top Gun, God help us or something. So like mm. you kind of you know that's what he's going to do. So it works well with that. Can can we combine the two? Can we make it a remake? But it's a I mean, maybe you make him as the admiral. Of, yeah, you make Tom yeah, Cruise yeah. the admiral. I mean, you still call it, you going, can... you're you're a Nimrod. There's no way that you're you're this elite pilot. And, well, let's be honest, though. Tom Cruise could pass for like whatever age he was in the first movie. He hasn't aged a day. <laughs> no, he like. hasn't. He's got he's got some weird unicorn magic that's keeping him eternally twenty eight years old. Yep. Wow. Um. So we could do like we could just call it Top Gun, but Tom Cruise is the admiral on the ship. Sure. I feel like we're going in like four different directions here. We need to bring it bring it back into where we're on the right track. Well, like you said, combine the two. Have him start out with with Tom Cruise as the admiral, and have him have that minor role. You know, he doesn't have to play as big a prominent role. It's just kind of a nod to the original. Go through the training with the new Maverick, and and or no, you can't have new Maverick. They'll have to have new call signs, right? Mm-hmm. With the new Maverick esque character, um, you know, his competitor, his his best friend. You still have all that, but just different call signs. And uh, they go through the training, they graduate, and then then uh, stuff starts going down from this unknown enemy that attacks them, and they have to win everything back over American soil. Wow, I kind of like that. But Tom Cruise would still be Maverick, right? He's like the only Maverick. So yeah, he, he would still be yeah, Maverick. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we, we, me and Scott are both referring to whoever the other quote-unquote Maverick is, is just for lack of a term for whatever the call sign is, for right. this rambunctious rascal. Mm-hmm. It's a bit of a sequel and a reboot at the same time because it's the same Tom Cruise is playing Maverick. He's playing the same character, but he's moved on through the ranks of being a Top Gun instructor. And now he's actually an admiral on an aircraft carrier that's stationed outside of Boston in the Boston Harbor. Uh, or they're, they're, That's where they are at the final act of the movie anyway. So he's training and he's training a hotshot pilot. It's really, really good. That reminds him of himself. He's not Maverick. He's just a Maverick-like character. He's like himself, but he's got a different call sign. And then if you got the same kind of stuff going on. This new guy is is trying to uh, become the best of the best of the best. He's got a competitor. He's got a best friend that has, that's his uh, co-pilot. And you have all that kind of same stuff that goes on. We just get rid of the stuff we don't like. And then after they graduate, they get attacked by whatever this enemy is. And their carrier is sunk. They escape to this uh, base in Boston, and they get hooked up with some planes, and they go wreak havoc and save the day over American soil through, like, a metropolis area. All right. Are you I'm down with that. Well, the Boston Navy Yard, is that do they have Navy ships there? I don't think they do. But I'm not familiar. I actually looked a little bit. I just looked for an Air Force base in Boston, and, the, and it's actually the largest one in the country is the one that I mentioned. So Okay. They've got Coast Guard ships there. The Westover. TCH. Can't cuss anymore. Trying to be good, but you're making me want to cuss. Okay, they train on the aircraft carrier, and then the aircraft carrier goes down, and that's when they go back and they get... To... Well, they're, well, they're in the Atlantic during the training. Right. You know what okay. I mean? They're, they're out in there, and then after they graduate, they're heading back towards Boston, and that's and once they're in the, in the harbor, that's when things start happening, and then they're forced into this battle like right away, right after graduation. I like it. So Maverick's Maverick's the admirable. You still get Charlie as an instructor on the ship, like a civilian instructor. I don't. I assume. I, didn't, that, I don't know if I they didn't would get have that Charlie. Far because, I, or I kick really Charlie out. Don't even think we. Yeah, I don't think we need Charlie in it at all. Ooh, there's a lot of ladies that aren't going to be happy about that. We can have another Blake Lively type. <laughs> you know, the gratuitous love interest that's in any male adrenaline pumping, you know, type movie. So you want to keep yeah, it just guys flying planes. Yeah, 
pretty yeah. much. Okay, so basically it's a guys, guys movie. Guys, 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 yeah. all dudes, all the time. Okay, so the one thing is that you can't you can't train on the aircraft carrier because Top Gun School is in, in Reno, Nevada. So what what do we do, Scott? What was your idea? You had an idea. They're they're training in Nevada because you said that's where the Air Force the, the Air Force Base is now, or where mm-hmm. the Top Gun Training Academy is, correct? Correct. Right. So they they're training there because because one of the iconic scenes from the first movie was they're at their graduation ceremony. They're all decked to the nines in their whites, is that they're called? The dress, dress whites, yeah. Dress whites, yeah. Dress whites. And they get these orders and everybody gets get these commands because there's an emergency situation. Well, this emergency right. situation is on a coastal area somewhere in the United States. Like I mentioned Boston earlier, but it could be wherever. I like the idea sure. of it being somewhat near Washington, D.C., so it's a really big threat. And they scramble and they have to get over to that aircraft carrier. And then we had the decision to either have that aircraft carrier get destroyed and they go to the local Air Force Base or they just have to fight off of that aircraft carrier and but I like the idea of it being over the American soil in a mid- metropolis area with skyscrapers and, and the recognizable landmarks that they're flying well, in and around. They could be en route. And when they get word that the carrier went down and so, you know, the planes and the forces that were combating the threat have already sunk. So they have to go to a different base and grab new planes and hit the action in the city, downtown Boston, heading, okay, heading toward okay. Washington. We- yeah, and I was going to kind of expand on that, which really is almost a little bit of both of those. They're going to that ship, and then whenever the number one team goes there, let's say the Iceman team, end up uh, they end up dying, and then the backups end up fighting off the forces, avenging their deaths. Say that again? Let's say Iceman's group goes to Boston, okay. right? The Iceman. The, the new the Iceman. Best, the new Iceman. Yeah, right. we'll, we'll call him Captain Cool. <laughs> okay, Cap- Captain Cool's team goes to goes to Boston. They they help support that carrier that's in that area. Well, the Maverick group goes to a different Boston, a different carrier, maybe that's uh, off the coast of Virginia or whatever's closer to Boston, and they end up supporting them. They're they're just there on on standby as backups. We're efforting troops to get there a little closer for support. But they can't get there quite quick enough. So by the time they get there, Iceman's group is is already dead. Whoa. Dramatic turn. Well, yeah, because we had the death of Goose in the original, and that could be the... That That could be be the 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 switch. The equivalent without doing the same thing. You're kind of doing the same thing, but you're doing it a little bit different. I -hmm. like it. Oh, I like it. Now, now, finally, it's starting to sound like a movie. It sounded like a bunch of gibberish there for a long time. I think we're good. You're going to have to have the, the new Iceman and the new Maverick, and I'm, that's just what I'm calling them because we don't have call signs for them. You're going to have to have them get along a lot better before that happens because right. Maverick and Iceman really didn't get along even once they left because if you remember, Iceman made the comment to the general or whoever, you know, do you think that uh, Maverick's the right guy for the job? I mean, you know, he, and he, wasn't being a, he wasn't being a jerk. He was just – he was more concerned about him yeah. being yeah. still being distraught over, over Goose. And then they finally, when when uh, Maverick took care of him in that actual final battle, that's when Iceman says, you can be my wingman any time. You have to have that moment before the actual battle. So you have to have some kind of thing where they're, they're good buddies now looking out for each other. Right. They actually they, bond, and they actually they, they get past whatever differences they have, and they actually have to bond to where you feel, as a viewer, you have to feel that, they're all right, they got that, that brotherly blindness. bond. Yeah. Yeah. And we we have to put Maverick back at the Air Force Base where he belongs because he's got to be like the Viper role as opposed right. to being the Admiral because then he'd be dead and nobody wants to watch Maverick die in a Top Gun movie. I'm sorry. They just don't. No, nope. I don't think that's Fair what enough. should happen. I think, so, that, I think that's the too, the too easy route. Yeah, absolutely. But we're going to scrap the whole romantic angle. It's still just... Yeah, I don't... Well, he could have an instructor that he a... flirts with, though. I mean, you don't have to have, just skip the romance. Just... One of the instructors he keeps flirting with, but she rejects him. Like she's actually a strong, independent woman and doesn't need him. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm totally fine with that. I'm totally just maybe she passively encourages him, but for the most part, on the surface, she's shutting him down. Mm-hmm. But um, she gives him that that little hint that there might be an end. I'm going to keep pursuing it. And then maybe like at the very end of the movie, she they come across each other at some point after the events because he is mourning 
Iceman, Captain Cool, <laughs> whatever the hell his call sign. We're not going to give call signs because I think we would just get everything all wrong. Um, but she can see him and give him a little wink or a nod or, or some some acknowledgement that maybe there's a chance down the road. There you go. You know, one of those sweet moments that don't have to scream it in your face. Okay, I think we got. I think we got a movie. I think there's actually a movie here. So, uh, who should direct this movie? This Top Gunster piece. Why not Ridley Scott? <laughs> sold. I'm sold in honor of his brother. I'm sold. I think it. Yeah, I, I'm sold. <laughs> Why not? He's got action movie chops. He really has a very similar style as 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 Tony Scott. So why not? Okay. I, I don't have any problem with with him either. I just had uh, one one suggestion down that I wanted to make mention. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Chad Stahelski. He's got the did John Wick. Okay. Uh, not so much for the fight scenes where we don't have a whole lot of hand-to-hand combat or something, but let's be honest, one of the coolest parts of this movie are those air combat scenes and the in you know the cinematography and the shots that were made there. And the tone that he's got in that movie I thought would be kind of cool, but I'm also behind your guys' pick too. So Good option. I uh, just think Ridley mm-hmm. Scott won. Who, who is our uh, new not Maverick Maverick? Like who who is our new hero? Based on uh, based on our remake, we got if we cast two leads, like let's say if we cast Maverick and the Iceman character, who would who would they be? Who's the new Maverick? I can tell that you that is who... the hardest thing in the world to do. <laughs> Cause... Good God, I no had kid. John Boyega. He's Finn in uh, Star Wars. Yeah. Oh, okay. I haven't I haven't seen him play anything else except Finn. Yeah, and he's kind of a, like Attack unsure the... about half of that movie. No, about yeah. let's go going see on. Attack the Block. He's a cocky, full of himself. And... I'm just I haven't watched Attack oh, no, the no, Block, I'm so just, I'm just okay, saying in Star Wars, which is the only reference I have for him, is a guy that is for the most part of that movie he's unsure of what the hell is going on, much less of what what he's capable of. And I need somebody that has a strength and and can convey assuredness, that cockiness, that confidence, that I know what I'm doing when I'm in that pilot seat. And but and honestly, it's... if you if you were to go to from with somebody from from Star Wars, I would I would say Oscar Isaac. And he's too than, old. Yeah, he's too I, old. I, I, no, I'm, I I agree with you, but just somebody someone with that the... charisma. Right. Well, I wasn't right. I wasn't going for someone with from Star Wars. <laughs> I was just going with someone that I thought was a good pick. <laughs> I know. Uh um, well, <laughs> I went with the confidence thing too because it, it's so hard to recast Tom Cruise because Tom Cruise should just play Tom Cruise, but you mm-hmm. know, obviously we've already got him as our as the uh, admiral or whatever in the, in our movie. So I wanted someone that portrayed confidence but also had that uh you know, ability to be broken, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And again, another one I don't know how to pronounce his last name, Alex Pettifer. Are no, with that actor? no, I freaking hate that kid. I, I don't find <laughs> him to be, I just don't like him. I don't think he's a very good actor. I just, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't mean to poo poo your choice, man. I really don't. No, no, it's fine. I, I like I said, I, I poured over screenshots of guys for like the longest time trying to find someone that even looked remotely as cool. Um, and the only thing I've really seen him in, well, he was in I Am Number Four, and then he played the lead in Magic Mike, who he had that confidence thing down halfway through that movie. I, I disagree. I think he's horrible. Sorry, I'm. I'm seriously. I'm just. I'm really avid against well, that guy. All right, so what about like maybe Alexander Skarsgård? He's too old too, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, he's too old. He's like thirty. You're. You can't be thirty-five and and be at the Top Gun school. Really? Because you I by the time you graduate the academy, if you if you you're in your early thirty-five is mid, almost retired. Mid, early to mid twenties. <laughs> so you've got to you've got to accrue the the experience to become even a Top Gun candidate. So you're looking at probably a few years worth of flying. So you're looking at late 20s. Either one of those people, the Pettifer or the or Skarsgård, could play late 20s. Uh, well, I don't think Skarsgård looks Anthony late 20s. Anthony Edwards was going bald in that stuff. I'm just saying. I don't think Skarsgård <laughs> looks late 20s. And I don't, I mean, I just. I Have just, you seen uh, the Tarzan trailer? Just yeah, saying. I think he looks lame, actually. But um, I guess we could debate that somewhere else. But Alex Pettifer, I don't like at all. I just don't find him to be a good actor. How about Richard Madden? Richard Madden. Uh, Kid he, Harrington? No. I thought about Kid Harrington, actually. Red, Red, Richard Madden is um, the other Stark on Game of Thrones. The one in Red Wedding did get. God, he's as old as the others. No, he's not. He's How 29. Old is he? Yeah, he's 29. He's, oh, he's, 20, he's late 20s. Oh, God, I rest my it's effing just, case. It's usually about 25, <laughs> but that's okay. I kind of want to hear him do an American accent. I don't think I've seen him do something without a European accent or British. 
I'm not, I'm not <laughs> knocking it. I just we've wanna... never been this stuff. It's I'm funny cut, because you... cut, cut. It's Richard Madden. It's gonna be Richard Madden. That's who it is. Richard Madden is is, is our new Maverick, not Maverick. Okay, there you go. All right. So, so if you guys got a, an Ice Man, Richard Madden, by the way, if, if you saw Cinderella, he's Prince Charming for the ladies. And if you watch Game of Thrones, he's no longer with Game of Thrones. So, with. <laughs> Uh, anybody have a pick for the Iceman character, the one that eventually apparently will perish? Now, I'm okay with Alex Pettifer for that one, because he'll die. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine if you want to put him there. Uh, you, you that or I, I had Ansel Elgort, the guy from Fault in Our Stars. Oh, he's cool. Ooh, he's, he's, boring it. he's boring as whatever else. You know what? I could go with Sk- Alexander Skarsgård again on that. He To me, he could he can play that that arrogant guy that, you know what, I'm better than you and you know it. And I'm going to show you how much better than you. I really am. Well, I don't agree that he's boring at all. I think he's actually really entertaining. Yeah. I thought he was, he was pretty really, charismatic. Yeah. Fault in our stars. He's great in that movie, by the way. I don't necessarily think that he's like cocky Navy pilot though, but he could be cut. Alexander Skarsgård is you, you want a 40 year old doing your, <laughs> your training. Is that what you, that's the dream? All right. It's your cut. Doesn't, it's my cut. It's my cut. It doesn't matter what I want. That's my cut. That, that's you true. deal with it. <laughs> that's true. He's 39 years old, Brian. He's 39. No freaking way he ever and gets he into the top like gun. he looks like he's 25. What's no, he point? does not look like okay, he's 25. he's got no problem with Alexandra Daddario playing an 18-year-old kid again, even though she's 30 years old. Just saying, because, but because she's she's gifted in certain. No, it's cool. He'll be Maverick's dad for reasons. <laughs> you're okay with that. He'll be Maverick's dad. It's cool. There's your father's your dead father's story right there, boy. You can just hey, angle it. You but. you can you can, you can talk <laughs> trash all you want, but that's my cut. That's what's going to be done. All right. So shall it be said? So shall it he's is. A, right he's a late now. bloomer. Late bloomer at this Top Gun school. All right. What in the nostalgic moments does a remake need? Uh, these are nods to the original, and these are the ones we decided pre-show. So here's what we have to have in our remake. They have to be, have nods to the original movie. There has to be Buzz in the Tower. There have to be flybys, negative Ghost Rider, that whole thing. Uh, either you have to have a volleyball game or one has to be playing in the background. So if you don't have one, like say Reno is not known for its sand, you know, it's it's not. I mean, Reno. Well, I guess Reno does have a lot of sand, doesn't it? That's it's all. a desert. It is Nevada. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> I gotta go to bed. All what right. the crap, Aaron? <laughs> okay, so there has to be. Yeah, we should have a marsh, but it's not in Florida. That place doesn't I mean, have any marshes. It's in the desert. It's in the desert, but you know, it's, it's, it's not all known good. For sand. All right, Danger Zone has to be in the movie somewhere. I think we can all agree on that. Just not as much. Yeah. Just not as much. But one time, maybe in the credits, even is fine. I don't know. Uh, I feel the need, the need for speed has to be in here. There's that line has to be in here at some point. And the Kansas City barbecue, that's the location where the piano sing along and the jukebox ending. Even if it's now taking place somewhere else, the scene has to be shot there as an homage to the original. Yeah. I, That'd be cool. I, yep. It's kind of a little iconic little place. I've actually visited that place. It is so small. It is amazing how small that place is. But if you pay attention, you can see a big mirror on the background that gives the illusion that it is larger than it appears. Okay. Well, we got one last clip of the original Top Gun before you are treated to our butchering of the sequel remake. Here's the last clip. It's on your mind. My options, sir. Simple. First, you've acquired enough points to show up tomorrow and graduate with your Top Gun class. Or you can quit. There'd be no disgrace. That spin was hell or what he shook me up. So you think I should quit? I didn't say that. The simple fact is you feel responsible for Goose and you have a confidence problem. Now I'm not gonna sit here and blow sunshine up your ass, Lieutenant. A good pilot is compelled to always evaluate what's happened so he can apply what he's learned. Up there, we gotta push it. That's our job. It's your option, Lieutenant. All yours. He's got a confidence problem. Ladies, you know what that means. All right, so (laughs) I think we got our movie. 
We've talked a lot. It's been pretty all over the place. So let's hear Wayne Henderson and let him tell us what we came up with coherently. Here is Wayne Henderson's trailer for Top Gun. There is one school where the country's finest pilots go to learn and ultimately prove they are the best of the best. After convincing a familiar face that he has what it takes, our modern maverick is forced to overcome his cocksure swagger and show the United States military that he's much more than just another pretty face. It is all put to the test when a sudden attack over the Atlantic calls for an immediate response and it's left to the cockpits of our greatest pilots to fend off America's certain annihilation. Next summer, buzz the tower and head straight into the danger zone as Ridley Scott reimagines the Tom Cruise classic for a new era of aviators. Do you feel the need, the need for speed? Then grab your helmet and strap in. We're headed to Top Gun. Thank you, Wayne. Great job, as always. That was awesome. Woo. Oh, man. <laughs> I feel the need. I want to see it now. Yep. You can always hire Wayne. Go to MediaVoiceOvers.com. That illustrious voice is available, so please check that out. So what do you guys think? Did we nail it, or do you have a better pitch? Email us your thoughts on this week's show. Cash and ideas or a short pitch to remake this movie right at gmail.com. We might mention you on the next teaser episode. Guys, what do you think? Was it a good movie? Great movie? Eh, what was all right? Or does it make you want to watch the original again? Exactly. <laughs> I watched it last night, and I kind of want to go watch it again right now. Like you want us to wait, and you can go and come back and see how <laughs> No, like right after I leave here, I might go fired up again. It was that good. What was the line I was just telling you guys before we started? With the line that I love. Um, I need a beer to put these flames out. Yes, I need a beer to put these flames out. God, I love that. <laughs> All right, well, that's our movie. That's our remake of Top Gun. Scott, where can people find you? Well, as uh, most of you are aware, I am also on the Hollywood Outsider with Aaron and Brian, both of them, along with Justin McCumber, and we yeah. we have a weekly podcast where we talk about movie and TV news and what we've been what we've been seeing. I'm also uh, the host of the Gaming Outsider podcast, which is all about video games. It was really really hard for me not to mention the Top Gun Nintendo game on this episode, but I withheld myself, so it was good. But you can check us out at thegamingoutsider.com, and we've got a weekly episode that airs every Wednesday. Brian, where can people find you? On the Twitter or whatever? Yeah, on the Twitter at B-R-I-A-N-W-M-S. Of course, you can always email me at, at the Hollywood Outsider, feedback at the HollywoodOutsider.com, Facebook, the group, that kind of stuff. So I'm stalkable. Bring it. <laughs> okay, you can please review us on iTunes. Give us a thumbs up on Stitcher or throw our RSS feed in your podcast app of choice. Please remember Wayne Henderson. He's available at MediaVoiceOvers.com. He also does 112263, the podcast, and all Packers fan podcasts. So be sure to check him out. We have a Remake This Movie Facebook group, not just for fans of any shows, just for anybody that wants to talk about TV, movies, whatever. Feel free to hop on over there and join up. The link is in the show notes. RemakeThisMovieRight.com is a website. Twitter is at RemakeRight. That's going to do it for this episode of Remake This Movie Right. And the next movie you watch, remember that it will get a remake someday. And only you can make it better. Take care. And buzz more towers. <laughs> Negative Ghost Rider, the pattern is full. The pattern is full.